I realize that on many points uh, I may end up preaching to the choir this evening, but I must admit to being a little nervous speaking on this topic. And um, if I end up uttering any heresies in the next hour, I think the blame should lie with Jack Rhoda <laughs> and, and Kelly Clark, who, who are the ones who uh, roped me into participating in this program. I don't know about you, but I have really appreciated the series of talks that we've had over the last several weeks. I thought Bud Bauma's talk last week was excellent. And like Bud, I'm uh, absolutely convinced that evolution, with its dual themes of uh, common ancestry and natural selection, is the best explanation we have for how life developed on Earth and for how varied, complex, and interrelated all of life is. You know, in science, theories are more than just hunches or guesses. They are models that attempt to account for a wide array of phenomena in the natural world. And evolution is a very successful model. So the next time you hear someone say that evolution is just a theory, I hope you'll set them straight on the matter. Over the years, I've become more and more impressed by the theory of evolution's tremendous explanatory power. It can explain uh, the biogeographic distribution of species on our planet. Why, for instance, most of the animals in, uh, native to Australia are marsupials. Why, for example, the Hawaiian Islands are home to thousands of native uh, species of fruit flies, but no indigenous ants. Evolution can also explain the appearance and disappearance of species over vast stretches of geologic time and can account for transitional forms in the fossil record. It can explain both anatomical and embryological similarities in various species. If you were here last week, you may remember Bud showing us a slide of the forelimbs of, of bats and whales and, and birds and humans, uh, similarities that suggest common ancestry. Evolution is also able to account for the genetic similarities uh, between species, including between uh, human beings and the higher primates. Evolution is able to explain all of these things, and it is able to make predictions, as in, if evolution is true, here is what we should find if we go looking for X, Y, or Z. For example, scientists have undertaken several comparisons of gene sequences across various species, and their work on this front has revealed patterns that confirm predictions of common ancestry made by studying the fossil record. A particularly striking example, and one relevant to our discussion this evening, is how geneticists back in the 1980s studied samples of DNA from people all around the world uh, and used their DNA as a kind of clock to go back and pinpoint the, the time and the location uh, of the earliest anatomically modern human beings. The results of their research zeroed on Africa around 200,000 years ago. And that just happens to be the same date and location of the oldest uh, human fossil remains. So here we have an example of independent uh, corroborating evidence. Now, I don't believe that evolution explains everything. I'm not persuaded, for instance, that it can fully account for aspects of human existence like morality and religion. But as an explanation of biological life as such, I think the theory of evolution is right up there with the theory of gravity and the germ theory of disease. My earliest recollection of thinking about evolution goes back to 1976 in a biology course I had in my freshman year of high school. I can't remember if we were doing a unit on evolution or if evolution just happened to come up, but I do remember going up uh, to my teacher after class one day and asking, what about God? Uh, how does God fit into all of this? Um, my teacher's name, incidentally, was Mr. Dawkins, which, <laughs> which I find ironic given that the most uh, blowhard atheist advocate of evolution today is another uh, Mr. Dawkins, Richard Dawkins. Uh, he reminds me of that uh, Looney Tunes cartoon character, Foghorn Leghorn. Um, anyway, my Mr. Dawkins answered my question by saying, well, you know, Dan, you can just think of evolution as the way that God decided to create everything. And you know, that answer satisfied me, and in some respects, many respects, it still 
It still does. It spared me any crisis of faith. After that, I didn't think about evolution at all for another 20 years. And then in the summer of 95, um, I read two books on human evolution in quick succession. In the Age of Humankind by Roger Lewin and Lucy, The Beginnings of Humankind by Donald Johansson. Lucy is the nickname that Johansson gave to a 3.4 million year old hominid fossil uh, female, uh, which he discovered back in 1974. Um, he nicknamed her Lucy because on the evening of the discovery, he and his team were playing the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, over and over again. I think it was something like 47 out of 207 bones of her skeleton that he, uh, that he uncovered. Hers turned out to be only the first of 363 partial skeletons representing the same hominid species, Australopithecus afarensis. Around the same time, I read C.S. Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain. In that book, he has a chapter on the fall of man, and in that chapter, he uh, presents a retelling of creation and fall from a modern evolutionary perspective. I'd like to just read a portion of his retelling for you. You have it in your handout. <clears throat> what exactly happened when man fell, we do not know. But if it is legitimate to guess, I offer the following picture, a myth in the Socratic sense, a not unlikely tale. For long centuries, God perfected the animal form, which was to become the vehicle of humanity and the image of himself. Then, in the fullness of time, God caused to descend upon this organ a new kind of consciousness, which could say I and me, which could look upon itself as an object, which knew God. God came first in his love and in his thought. We do not know how many of these creatures God made, nor how long they lived in the paradisal state, but sooner or later they fell. Someone or something whispered that they could become as gods that they could cease directing their lives to their creator and taking all their delights as uncovenanted mercies, as accidents in the logical sense, which arose in the course of a life directed not to those delights, but to the adoration of God. They wanted, as we say, to call their souls their own. But that means to live a lie, for our souls are not, in fact, our own. They wanted some corner of the universe of which they could say, this is our business, not yours. But there is no such corner. They wanted to be nouns, but they were and eternally must be mere adjectives. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? We have no idea in what particular act or series of acts the self-contradictory impossible wish found expression. For all I can see, it might have concerned the literal eating of a fruit. But the question is of no consequence. The process was not, I conceive, comparable to mere deterioration as it may now occur in a human individual. It was a loss of a status as a species. What man lost by the fall was his original specific nature. This condition was transmitted by heredity to all later generations, for it was not simply what biologists call an acquired variation. It was the emergence of a new kind of man, a new species, never made by God, had sinned itself into existence. I don't agree with Lewis's portrait of a real drastic change in human nature. For one thing, he had a wildly exaggerated view of prelapsarian humanity, which he envisioned as a race of supermen who had control over their autonomic nervous systems, who ate and slept out of sheer delight and not out of any necessity, and who had yogi-like control over the animals. Nevertheless, reading Lewis on the fall helped shape my thinking about human evolution. For a few years, I had students in one of my classes at Calvin read this chapter of his. And for many of them, um, they were eased into thinking about evolution and found it less threatening when they heard it coming from the beloved author of the Chronicles of Narnia. The book that really got me thinking theologically about evolution was a book that came out in 1999. It's, uh, I brought it for show and tell. It's called Finding Darwin's God. It's by a Roman Catholic uh, cell biologist at Brown University named Kenneth Miller. 
in this book, he not only lays out all the different kinds of evidence for evolution, but he, he offers a devastating critique of both young earth creationism and intelligent design, as well as the so-called new atheism uh, associated with people like E.O. Uh, e. Wilson and Daniel Dennett and the notorious Richard Dawkins. Of the shelf full of books on evolution and Christian faith that I've read since 1999, I think Miller's is the best. Over the years, I've recommended it to various colleagues and students, and I know that it's been a required text in at least one biology course at Calvin. Another one I'd recommend, and that has meant a lot to me, is this short little volume. It's called Responses to 101 Questions About God and Evolution uh, by the Roman Catholic theologian John Haught. It asks and answers just about every conceivable question a, a Christian could ask about evolution and its implications for Christian faith. It's, it's really good, and it's really short, which is uh, kind of nice. I'll mention just one more book of the many that have meant a lot to me. It's, it's called Can a Darwinian Be a Christian by Michael Ruse. Ruse is a very engaging and at times a very witty writer, and he's also the most charitable uh, agnostic advocate of evolution that I know of, uh, the antithesis of someone like Daniel Dennett. He's very respectful of Christian theism and of Christian philosophers like Al Plantinga. Ruse's answer to the question in his title is, yes, you can be a Darwinian and a Christian, but there are some challenges. And one of the main ones is the whole problem of natural evil. Scientists tell us that all the things in nature that make us cringe, things like predation and parasitism, and other sorts of death and decay. All of these things, they tell us, are not only intrinsic to life on Earth, but absolutely necessary for life even to exist. I understand why they say that. Uh, Death is a thermodynamic necessity. The death of one generation literally makes room for the next generation. As Ruse notes, Darwinism shows that natural evil is not just some contingent thing readily explained away. Rather, the way in which organisms were created and the way in which they function is one which necessarily entails a great deal of pain and suffering. The source of new variation, random mutation, as often as not causes pain and suffering. For every mutation which brings benefit, there are hundreds which spell doom and disaster. The world, he says, is a package deal. And we simply have no right or no authority to say that God could have created in such a way as to prevent such physical evil as there is. The hard nature of physical existence and being is not, therefore, a rebuke against an all-powerful God. That's an agnostic saying that. And perhaps he's right on that last point. But as a Christian believer, I must confess, I still find it hard to accept that our God actively wills pain and suffering in any of his creatures. I have sometimes wondered whether after being endowed by God with the freedom to develop, uh, the natural world didn't take some wrong turns early on in life's history and end up enslaving itself to corruption. I rather doubt that that idea would carry any water with a paleobiologist, but... um, At the very least, I think it's legitimate, I hope it's legitimate, for us to regard pain and suffering as things that our good and loving God does not approve of, but that he allows within his providential purposes for a freely developing creation that on the whole he very much does approve of. Now, on the subject of the fall and the original sin, um, the first thing I want to say is that the story of Adam, Eve, and the serpent in Genesis 3 is not one of those just so stories of the sort Rudyard Kipling enjoyed writing. It is God's word to us, and on a certain level, it is also God's word about us. The serpent, you remember, is described as the craftiest of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. It misleads the woman not by lying outright, but by uttering misleading half-truths. It tells her, you will not die, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And in fact, the man and woman do not die on the day they eat of the fruit. 
And the Lord is pictured later in the chapter saying that they have become like God, knowing good and evil. The woman looks at the tree and sees that the fruit is good, a delight to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Her act is not described as a flagrant act of rebellion, a shaking of the fist at God. It looks more like the act of a naive innocent who has gotten in way over her head and been tricked by a master con artist. The man, incidentally, is a completely passive figure. He doesn't so much as pause while the fruit is on its way into his mouth. Even so, the woman and her mate have God's command not to eat of the tree of knowledge and God's warning of the consequences if they do. The story presumes that the man and woman know right from wrong. They know what obedience and disobedience are. And the result is that instead of receiving enlightenment and satisfaction, they receive alienation from God, estrangement from each other, and exile from paradise. Physical death as such is not part of the punishment they receive. This point is clear from verses 22 to 23, which depict the Lord being alarmed at the prospect that the man will reach out and eat of the tree of life and live forever. So what the man and woman lose is not immortality, but a chance at immortality. Their punishment includes not physical death, but a kind of living death, separation from God's unmediated presence, an end to their life of bodily ease, and a painful consciousness of their own mortality. A moment ago, I said that this story is also about us on a certain level. And what I mean is that we are like the man and woman. We are not to content. We are not content uh, to obey a God, a God who knows what is best for us, who wants to ease us into a proper experience of the world. We prefer autonomy to obedience. We would rather decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. We would rather strike out on our own and enjoy the world uh, on our own terms, in our own good time. But of course, there can be no true enjoyment of anything in this world apart from the one who made it. Now, reading Genesis 3 on this level, as symbolic of our present state, may be as fine as far as it goes, but for many, perhaps most Christians, it doesn't go far enough. As you're well aware, through the centuries, most readers of the Bible have received these chapters as a report about an actual incident involving real persons. Over the last several years, though, biblical scholars and now scientists have been inviting us to ponder what kind of narratives the early chapters of Genesis are and what sort of truth they intend to convey. Quite independently of science, biblical scholars have long recognized that Genesis 1 and 2 uh, present two distinct accounts of creation uh, that are difficult to reconcile if they're taken as history, but that complement one another if they're taken as story. Uh, this was the essential point made uh, two weeks ago by Krista Grude in her presentation. Scholars have also pointed out the story-like qualities of the narrative. The man and woman have symbolic names. Adam means human. Eve means living one. The talking snake looks like a figure out of folklore. The Lord God walks and talks in the garden, provides the man with a mate by a process of trial and error, and then seems alarmed at the prospect that the man will eat of the tree of life and live forever. Then, starting in the 1870s and going up through the 1960s, archaeologists discovered various ancient Mesopotamian tales of primeval times, uh, works with titles like the Gilgamesh Epic, the Atrahasis Epic, and the Enuma Elish. These ancient Near Eastern texts show remarkable surface similarities with the early chapters of Genesis and are much older than the biblical book. They've given biblical scholars a better grasp of the literary genre of Genesis and a clearer awareness of the bold theological claims inherent in the scriptural narrative. As I see it, God inspired the author of Genesis to borrow, combine, and transform several details from these older stories, details that were widely known in the oral culture of the day. The similarities, uh, but, but then to transform them uh, and to give a radically new theology. The similarities include the creation of the first man out of clay, a garden paradise in the east, 
a lady of life whose name also means lady of the rib, a serpent that robs a man of a chance at immortality, and a global flood complete with an ark full of animals, a mountain top on which the ark comes to rest, birds sent out to reconnoiter the post-flood landscape, a sacrifice to the gods, and the rainbow as a token of divine will. The Lord led the authors of Genesis to craft stories out of these older traditions in order to communicate a radically different theology. In Genesis retelling, there is one God, not many gods. And this God does not have to battle other gods before creating the world because he is all-powerful and completely sovereign. He is also just and merciful, not capricious like the gods in ancient Near Eastern religions. In Genesis, God creates all human beings, not just the king, in his own image. And he creates them for loving relationship, not slavery. Humans are meant to live in fellowship with God and with each other, and in harmony with the rest of the creation, not in fear of the gods, placating them in order to avoid the destructive forces of nature, which were themselves thought to be gods. Now, there are Christians who accept the story-like features of Genesis 3, but who insist that there must be an essential event character or, a to, or, or historical core to the story. Some of these folks are my colleagues, and so I've asked them uh, what the historical core is. Is it the walking, talking snake? No, they say. What about the garden paradise with the two trees? Well, no, that can be seen as a literary motif. What about animals and humans originally being vegetarians? No, that clearly was never the case. What about there being only one man and one woman at the dawn of the human race? No, that's not absolutely essential. All right, then, what about the fall being a single event at a particular point in time? No, the fall could have been a gradual thing spread out over a long period of time. Well, after going through all that, I asked them, what is the historical core of Genesis 3? The answer they give is that there must have been an ontological divide, a clearly demarcated before and after, which is to say a fundamental radical change in human nature pre- and post-fall. In their view, human beings before the fall were not just sinless, but immune to any selfish tendencies that would have predisposed them to sin. I understand the theological motivation for insisting on that. It's to avoid making God responsible for human sin, which is something that I would like to avoid also. I agree with them that if human beings started out sinful, then God would be to blame for our sinfulness. And yet I feel compelled to ask them, if you're willing to whittle away at Genesis 3 so that practically nothing is left, which you regard as historical, Wouldn't it be much simpler uh, to admit that the narrative is a story through and through? It seems to me that if the story has a historical core, it is simply this. We human beings have put ourselves out of right relationship with God by turning away from him and turning in on ourselves. And besides, it is not so clear that Genesis 3 pictures a fundamental change in human nature as such. The man and woman do not appear to be disinclined toward disobedience, but rather easily led into it. And later in the story, God tells Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. If these folks are right that the first human beings lived in a condition of original righteousness, as the phrase goes, then the very occurrence of the fall, I think, becomes difficult to imagine. Personally, I can well envision the first human beings living in a state of moral innocence. But I wonder if that innocence was more like the innocence of children, uh, which is to say a very fragile innocence. Something like this view was held by the early church father Irenaeus, who, unlike Augustine, understood Adam and Eve not as mature, perfect human beings, but as more like children whom God set on a journey toward maturity and perfection. 
As I said at the outset, though, I am not expert enough theologically to make full sense of all of this. In any case, at this point, I want to attempt a brief summary of what science has to say about human origins. As many of you know, the last few decades have witnessed a tremendous explosion of hominid fossil discoveries. We now have thousands of them. One more book for show and tell. If you're interested in these hominid fossil discoveries, um, the best book I know of is this big, beautifully illustrated volume from Lucy to Language. It's also uh, by Donald Johansson. Uh, in this book, he starts with the oldest hominid fossils that date from six to seven million years ago, and he goes all the way up through 40,000 years ago uh, to what Jared Diamond has called the Great Leap Forward, that time in history when we see in the archaeological record uh, a tremendous uh, explosion of human culture, as evidenced by the use of sophisticated tools, weaponry, and other artifacts, as well as art and music, and burial practices of a sort which suggest that human beings had begun assigning a religious meaning to death. This book was published in a revised and expanded version just six years ago, but it's now out of date since there have been other hominid uh, discoveries since then. The last few decades have also witnessed several landmark studies of animal behavior, as well as the mapping of the entire human genome and the genomes of several other mammal species. The work of paleontologists, geneticists, and other scientists has converged to offer an account of human origins that is at odds with the traditional Augustinian account. The scientific account can be summarized in six points, and you have these on your, your out, outline. First, death was operative in nature for hundreds of millions of years before Homo sapiens emerged on the scene. Second, human beings did not appear suddenly on Earth, but developed gradually from four or five earlier hominid species over the course of some six to seven million years. Third, the earliest Homo sapiens were a population of about 10,000 interbreeding individuals living in Africa around 200,000 years ago, and not two individuals living in Mesopotamia 6,000 years ago. Fourth, the earliest human beings did not live in paradisal physical conditions, but instead had to struggle, as all animals do, to sustain themselves. Fifth, archaic human beings would have possessed a strong tendency toward the same types of selfish behavior common to all animals. Sixth, and finally, human beings would have developed a spiritual awareness and moral sensibility only gradually over the course of tens of thousands of years. As I say, this scientific account uh, runs contrary to almost every point of the traditional Augustinian interpretation of Genesis, which affirms the instantaneous creation around 6,000 years ago of one man and one woman who fell from a state of uh, physical immortality and moral perfection and who were exiled by God into a world now cursed on their account uh, with death. Science undermines this traditional scenario, but we need to ask, does science necessarily undermine the doctrines of the fall and original sin and our need for redemption in Christ? I don't think so. Although biblical scholarship and evolutionary science do require some rethinking of traditional formulations of those doctrines, the essential claims of the doctrines remain intact. Now, a good number of Christians, especially evangelicals, deal with mainstream biblical scholarship and science by dismissing them outright. This is the case with young earth creationists like Ken Ham, who has a creation museum down in Kentucky, where if you want, you can go down and, and see a depiction of Adam and Eve cavorting with the dinosaurs. He thinks that biblical scholarship is the work of flaming liberals and that the theory of evolution is a theory cooked up by the devil himself. Other Christians take a different approach. They try to harmonize Genesis and science by offering an interpretation of the biblical text that accords with the scientific estimate of how long our species has been on earth and how large the earliest human population was. 
This approach, I think, is definitely an improvement over the first approach. One version of it suggests that Genesis 1 depicts God creating uh, pre-Adamite human beings, thousands of pre-Adamite human beings around 200,000 years ago, while Genesis 2 depicts God selecting or electing two Neolithic farmers, Adam and Eve, to be the so-called federal heads of the human race. This theory of federal headship seems promising at first, but there are at least three problems with it. First, it undermines the unity of the human race, since according to its scenario, we would not all be descendants of Adam and Eve. Second, it fails to provide a mechanism for the spread of sin's power over the human race. And third, for me as a biblical scholar most significantly, it doesn't arise from a natural reading of a Genesis narrative, but takes its cue from modern science. In other words, it lets science uh, uh, set the interpretive agenda by reading into Genesis things that just aren't there. And what I mean is that the book of Genesis does not think in terms of hundreds of thousands of years. And it does not depict God electing Adam and Eve to represent the human race, but rather creating them from scratch as the only two human beings on the planet. That's what Genesis pictures. The crucial question, of course, is whether that picture is a historical picture or a literary picture. Many Christians believe it is the latter. In other words, Adam and Eve are strictly literary representations of early humanity. They are characters in a divinely inspired story that offers a theologically profound, yet nonetheless an imaginative picture of how human beings came to be alienated from God. For many Christians, though, there's a real obstacle to taking Adam as a symbolic figure, and it has to do with New Testament teaching. As you, all, you guys are well aware, the Apostle Paul sets up a typological contrast between Adam and Christ. In Romans 5.12, he says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all because all sinned. And then in 1 Corinthians 15.22, he says, For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come, uh, come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. A lot of Christians argue that because Christ was a real person, then Adam must have been as well. I'm not so sure they are right. I'm inclined instead to agree with the New Testament scholar James Dunn. In his commentary on Romans, he has this to say, and here you can follow along uh, with the second extract in your handout. It would not be true to say that Paul's theological point in Romans 5 depends upon Adam being a historical individual or on his disobedience being a historical event as such. An act in mythic history can be parallel to an act in living history without the point of the comparison being lost. So long as the story of Adam as the initiator of a sad tale of human failure was well known, which we may assume, such a comparison was meaningful. Indeed, if anything, we should say that the effect of the comparison between the two epical figures, Adam and Christ, is not so much to historicize the individual Adam as it is to bring, about, uh, to bring out the more than historical significance of the historical Christ. So Paul's intention in Romans 5 and in 1 Corinthians 15 is not to establish the historicity of Adam, but to teach about the reality of sin and about God's work in Christ to free human beings from the power of sin and to grant them a share in Christ's resurrection life. Paul doesn't assert the historicity of Adam. He assumes it. In formulating his typology, his main point is to establish Christ as a representative figure, someone whose act affected not only himself, but the entire human race. So Adam's historicity, I would say, is not essential to Paul's teaching, but rather incidental to it. Not essential, but incidental. 
The same is true, I think, with the authors of the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. My sense is that when Paul found Adam in the book of Genesis, he had no reason to think of Adam other than as a historical figure. No literary analyses of Genesis, no ancient Near Eastern parallels to it, and and no modern science. Had he thought about the origins of the human race without regard to Genesis, I suspect that he would have assumed that since all human beings are born of the union of one man and one woman, then the entire human race must ultimately go back to one man and one woman. Monogenism was simply a cultural assumption of the day. And perhaps Paul's assumption of Adam's historicity may be attributed to what our Reformed tradition calls divine accommodation. That is to say, the Holy Spirit accommodated or adapted divine revelation to the cultural understanding of Paul. God did not bother to correct this aspect of his ancient worldview. Why? Because doing so was not important for faith or for salvation. A friend of mine named Bethany Solarator, who's writing her doctoral dissertation on evolution and theodicy, uh, makes an important point here. In a short essay of hers posted on the BioLagos website, she says, Most of us take for granted that if we read the Bible, we need someone who can translate from the original languages of Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic before we have a hope of understanding what is being said. What is less acknowledged is that worldviews and cultural assumptions must also be translated. Ancient perspectives, whether in science or history, must be moved into forms that make sense to a contemporary audience and to the questions a modern mind is asking. Now, at first blush, it sounds almost blasphemous to suggest that Paul was wrong and arrogant to say that we know better. After all, he was divinely inspired, and we are not. And for the record, I really do believe that Paul's letters are divinely inspired. But I don't believe that affirming their inspiration requires the belief that Paul was never wrong about anything. Adam and Eve aside, it's pretty clear from 1 Thessalonians 4 that Paul expected Jesus to come back in his lifetime. He writes to the Thessalonians and speaks of himself and of them being alive at the Lord's return. In that expectation, he was obviously wrong. And if he was wrong about that, then I don't think it's irreverent to suggest that he was wrong about Adam being a historical individual. Let's now consider what the fall might look like if Genesis 3 is taken not as history, but as story. And if Adam is not regarded as a historical figure, but a symbolic one. Here's one attempt, one attempt at working it out. It begins with the idea that God endowed the creation with the freedom to become, to grow and develop through the evolutionary process. That process eventually produced a rational species, us, with the same tendencies towards selfish behavior common to all animals. The original selfishness of early human beings, however, was an amoral selfishness. The instinct toward self-preservation was necessary for our species even to come into existence, much less to survive. Then over time, a very long time, tens of thousands of years, our remote ancestors attained a level of self-consciousness that included the ability to know God, to know God's will, and to keep that will. They reached a level at which they had the capacity to transcend their self-serving instincts when those instincts impinged upon the freedom of their fellow human creatures. God's will could have been communicated to them either through a special revelatory event or series of events or through the Holy Spirit prompting their conscience. But they chose not to obey God's will. They chose instead to turn away from God and in on themselves, and their doing so became sin, that is, culpable wrongdoing. That sinfulness was then passed on to their progeny, both biologically and socially. 
According to this scenario, then, the human race grew into its current moral and spiritual state. This, by the way, is also where the image of God comes in, whether one thinks of it in terms of our cognitive abilities like language or our capacity to relate to God spiritually or our uh, commission by God to be stewards of the creation or a combination of all three. Our sinful nature developed at the same time as our rational faculties, our spiritual awareness, and our moral sensibilities. No particular event would mark the time when all human beings on earth fell into sin. Instead, we may imagine many events in which various human groups and individuals fell into sin. They would have turned away from God or not responded to God's luring them in the direction he wanted them to go, to the point where eventually all sinned and fell short of God's ideal for our race. Humanity's spiritual status before God would have been an ambiguous one until sin had spread to all humans. In this account, original righteousness would not have been the actual state of early human beings, but a potential one. This is a scenario that I believe is compatible with Scripture and with the three central claims made by the doctrines of the fall and original sin. And those three claims are, quite simply, that we are sinners, that we are powerless to overcome our sinful nature, and that we need a Savior. It's also a scenario that can work with different understandings of the human soul, whether we conceive of God creating the soul miraculously, as in traditional body-soul dualism, or using natural processes so that the soul becomes an emergent property of higher brain function, as in so-called non-reductive physicalism. At this point, I would like to direct your attention back to the handout where you will find two elaborations of the scenario I've just sketched. They come from two scientist theologians, both of them physicists. John Polkinghorne, an Anglican, probably the single best-known science theologian in our day, and then George Murphy, a Lutheran. So let's first have a look at Polkinghorne. I do not believe that Genesis 3 is the historical account of a single disastrous ancestral act, but a story conveying the truth about the relationship between God and humanity. Read in a literal way, the story would clearly be incompatible with well-established knowledge given us by scientific study of the past. Snakes do not speak. Thorns and thistles did not arise as a result of an act of human disobedience. And most important of all, death was present in the world long before it had any hominid inhabitants. I believe that the story of the fall should be interpreted in the following manner. Human beings are self-conscious in a way that I believe greatly exceeds any animal experience of consciousness, even in the case of the higher primates who are our nearest evolutionary cousins. It is almost impossible to imagine the dawning of this self-conscious power. Presumably, it was not a single discrete event, but a gradual process. This process will have been accompanied by a dawning consciousness of the presence of God, the formation of the Imago Dei. In the course of this process, there was a turning away of our ancestors from the pole of God into the pole of the human self. That process of which we are the heirs was the fall. The fall is indeed a fall upward, a gaining of knowledge, but it is an error to suppose that humans can thereby attain equality with their creator so that they can live their lives independently of God. The declaration of complete human autonomy, the assertion that we can simply do it my way, is the root meaning of sin. The refusal to acknowledge that we are creatures in need of the grace of our Creator is the source of subsequent human sins. Okay, now let's have a look at what George Murphy has to say. This is a, a longer excerpt, and it's the one I'd really like you to try like for you to try on for size. If there was no Adam and Eve and no historical fall, the need for a savior disappears. The structure of Christianity collapses. 
Such claims about the implications of evolution are sometimes made both by Christians who reject evolution and by evolutionists who reject Christianity, people who may agree on little else. An honest person supposedly must reject either evolution or Christianity. Evolution does require that we rethink traditional ideas about righteousness, sin, and salvation, but the argument just sketched fails. The Christian claim is that a savior is needed because all people are sinners. It is that simple. Why all people are sinners is an important question, but an answer to it is not required in order to recognize the need for salvation. None of the Gospels uses the story in Genesis 3 to speak of Christ's significance. In Romans, Paul develops an indictment of the human race as sinful and then presents Christ as God's solution to this problem in chapters 1 to 3 before mentioning Adam in chapter 5. In proclaiming the gospel message to people who have not heard it, we do not begin by trying to convince them that there was a sin of the first humans in which they were involved. The basic gospel message is instead, you were a sinner and Christ is your savior. The crucial distinction here is between the idea of an original sin, which took place at the beginning of human history, and that of a sin of origin, which affects all human beings from their beginnings and from which they cannot free themselves. The need for a savior is dependent upon the latter belief, but not upon the former. If Adam and Eve represent all humans, then they represent also the first humans. And if humanity has been sinful from the time it came into being, without doing anything to become sinful, sin would be a part of human nature itself. This would mean that, in an important sense, God was the creator of sin. To avoid this conclusion, we must use biblical texts about creation and sin for guidance in trying to understand how the first human sin might have had a role in bringing about a sinful condition as part of the evolutionary process. How could a sin committed by the first humans result in a condition in which all later humans are sinners from the beginning of their lives? Let us imagine the first group of hominids who had evolved to the point of self-awareness and linguistic ability. We regard the evolutionary course by which this condition was reached as one in which God was continually at work through natural processes as secondary causes. These humans have developed abilities to reason and communicate and are able and in some way to receive and at least faintly understand God's word, to trust that word and to know and obey God's will for them. We do not know in what way the expression of God's will may have come to them or what command may have corresponded to the prohibition of the tree of knowledge in Genesis. It might have concerned the way in which people should live together, but about that we can only speculate. These first humans are at the beginning of a road along which God wants to lead them and their descendants, to full maturity and complete fellowship with God. In principle, they can follow that road, but it will not be easy. They have inherited traits which enabled their ancestors to survive and to pass on their genes, and those traits will predispose them towards selfish behavior and away from the kind of community with God, one another, in creation, which God intends for them. Such behavior is not hardwired into them, but tendencies toward it are very strong. They can refuse to trust and can disobey what they know, however faintly, is God's will for them. History indicates that this is what happened. And the biblical story indicates that this is an accurate theological description of what happened. The first humans took a wrong road, one that leads to destruction away from the goal God intended. They and their descendants were soon alienated from God. Humanity was lost in the woods, and darkness had fallen. This image of taking the wrong road is, like that of the fall, a metaphor of the human condition, not a historical narrative. 
But the picture of gradual departure from the course of what God intends is, as we noted earlier, one which the early chapters of Genesis convey. Being participants in the evolutionary process means being God's creatures, which is good. The problem of sin is not that we are on a road, but that we are on the wrong road. Okay, so here we have two articulations of the fall and original sin in light of evolution that don't include a historical Adam and Eve. I have found them helpful, and I'm, I'm almost ready to sign on to them, even though I realize that they conflict at key points with the way Augustine and the Reformers understood the fall in Genesis, uh, the fall and original sin. Let me conclude now with a few brief comments about the nature of doctrines in general, since we're talking about the doctrine of the fall and the doctrine of original sin. You see, in Christian theology, doctrines are based on particular interpretations of passages in the Bible. And often, these interpretations were first crafted as alternatives to rival uh, Christian readings of the same passages. They do not offer a, a simple restatement or mere paraphrase of Scripture. Instead, doctrines synthesize discrete passages scattered across the canon. They attempt to harmonize discordant voices in the biblical witness, and they privilege some scriptural voices over others, extrapolating from them and applying them to issues that were not necessarily on the agenda of the biblical authors themselves. The doctrines of the fall in original sin are based on Genesis 3, but they do not come straight off the page of Genesis 3. The same is true, I think, with Adam's, uh, with Paul's understanding of sin. Paul clearly believed that sin and death entered the world through Adam. But it is not so clear that he thought of sin spreading to Adam's descendants in quite the same way that Augustine did. It is at least arguable that he thought of Adam's sin affecting the entire human race without infecting it in the way Augustine envisioned Augustine's full-blown doctrine of original sin represents a particular interpretation of Paul, one crafted in response to Pelagius and his followers. But his interpretation is not necessarily the only viable interpretation. With all due respect to Augustine and to the Reformers, who were brilliant theologians and who remain indispensable in our tradition, I want to suggest that for the Christian faith, to remain fully compelling for us, we must be willing at least to consider reformulating the doctrines of the fall and original sin in light of what science is showing us about God's creation. I'm not talking about rushing to revise our doctrines, but, but about being open to rethinking them. The task of Christian theology in every generation is not simply to repeat the tradition but to represent it in fresh ways so that it can continue to speak meaningfully to us. Doctrines invite revisiting and possible uh, reformulation when the church is confronted with new interpretations of Scripture and new understandings of the theological tradition and with new insights from the creation itself. Thank you. I don't know, do we have any questions? Is a possible consequence of your argument that the term original sin is no longer useful or not as useful as it once was? Should we be changing our vocabulary? The doctrine of original sin is really not a doctrine about what happened way back when. The original sin is a label that theologians give to our current condition, right? That all of us are born in sin, that we are the default position of the human heart is enmity with God. So it's a statement about our present 
spiritual state apart from God's saving grace in Jesus Christ. So I don't think the the phrase original sin needs to be dispensed with, and I I don't think the uh, the the reality that it points to uh, needs to be uh, doubted in any way. Dan, um, I certainly agree with you that there's a whole lot to think about here, and that uh, very much of this is in of our traditional ways of thinking about these things are uh, possibly revisable and under certain conditions maybe have to be revised. Uh, Nothing here is really set in stone. But I don't think I agree with you and um, George Murphy that the notion of the fall, the notion of an original human pair, and the notion of original sin then as a corruption that um, that spread from the original pair Um, genetically through the rest of the human race, I don't think there's anything in current science incompatible with that. It could very well be, here's a possibility, maybe uh, 200,000 years ago when there was this bottleneck of 100,000, 10,000 people on the road to being human beings, um, maybe God selected a pair of them and bestowed on them a particular property or virtue in virtue of which they were created in his image. Maybe they were uh, um, innocent, um, sinless, uh, but turned against the Lord, Mm -hmm. fell. Maybe both of these qualities were heritable and spread through the rest of the human race so so that we are now all descendants of that original pair, even though we're also descendants of others. I mean, the uh, the other creatures, hominids that were around at that same time. That's not incompatible with current science at all, as far as I can see. And no, it, I agree. It's not incompatible with uh, with current science. The guy that God, the idea that God would choose or elect two individuals. Um, I do see a problem, though, that I, I really I don't see how the unity of humankind can be affirmed. Um, because if there were these other human beings out there, presumably some of us would be descended from them, and others would be descended from that original pair, and so we wouldn't all be implicated necessarily in the the sin of that one pair. Um, so there's nothing, I agree with you, there's nothing against science to argue against that uh, selection or election of two individuals. I don't think there's anything in Scripture, though, to commend it, because as I say, Scripture pictures uh, uh, God creating one man and one woman, uh, de novo, with no one else around. So... Um, that's the problem I have with that scenario. But you're right. It's, it's the scenario you're talking about is not incompatible with anything in science. Yeah, I, I think you touched on this, but maybe you could say a little bit more, Dan. It just strikes me that evolution involved behavior, which we human beings showed would be sinful behavior. Right. Uh, I mean, whether the strong take the food away from the weak, uh, et cetera, or they eat them even. Uh, and... Uh, it's very clear that human beings have been commanded by God to care for the weak and the, and the sick and the needy. Mm-hmm. If you look at Christ's parables, the Old Testament, care for the widow, the orphan. I mean, before, in the animal kingdom, you'd uh, chase the uh, widow, the orphan away and uh, say, good, good going, now I get more food for myself. Right. Well, presumably, at creation or the emergence of human beings, what was right becomes wrong, or what's wrong becomes right. It, you know, there's a whole new moral standard there. And would you see that as evolving slowly over thousands of years, or isn't there room for this sort of, you know, following what Al was saying, that, that God would, that this would come rather quickly, quickly. to uh, maybe even, you know, a, a, a clan of human beings. Right. Because it's only as you have that kind of a picture that the fall makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's sort of the fall back into an evolutionary process the, right. where the human beings no longer obeyed this new law written in their hearts, but they're falling back into animal-like uh, right. selfish. I don't know. Could you ta- yeah, I, talk I about that? Yeah, I think you're right that, um, that it's possible to imagine God specially revealing himself to, uh, to a select group. And I, I'm like you. I'm a little troubled by the fact that um, you know, part of the game of surviving as a species and living long enough to reproduce uh, 
um, requires uh, acts, uh, what we call amoral selfishness, then all of a sudden when human beings come of age and God reveals himself to them, endows them with his image, they're expected to kind of all of a sudden go against those natural instincts or drives toward self-preservation. Um, part of this maybe goes back to the problem of evil. I, I'm really bothered by the way life is developed on earth, by, by destruction, by predation and parasitism and, and uh, it involving competition uh, for limited resources and, and the, the extinction of entire species who never have an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to be fulfilled as, as creatures. Uh, I think the problem of evil is a very tough nut to crack, and so far I, I haven't read or heard anything that, that helps crack it for me. But, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Another question? Kind of in line with the same the questions that have just been asked. Um, Al made reference to a, 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 a period of where there were 10,000 people, kind of a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. You made reference to um, an, an era of 200,000 years ago where a number of things so suddenly man be, appeared to become much more adept. Mm -hmm. In the fossil record and with, with Christian scientists and, and uh, theologians, has there been any kind of pinpointing of what, when, such a over time period of fall might have occurred. Mm. I mean, is there any kind of evidence to indicate that that might have happened at some point? Yeah. Um, well, the Great Leap Forward, as Jared Diamond calls it in his book, The Third Chimpanzee, 40,000 years ago in the archaeological record, all of a sudden you see this explosion of culture clothing, housing, art, music. Uh, sophisticated tools and weapons, and as I said, burial practices which suggest a religious significance being assigned to death. Um, that's the time we, I think, should look for the, the human race sort of coming of age, of being fully conscious, self-conscious, God-conscious, aware of God, and so then the fall uh, wouldn't have happened back, say, 200,000 years ago, because that's the date of the first anatomically modern human beings, not the first behaviorally modern human beings. 200,000 years ago means you could take someone back then, uh, give them a shave and a haircut, put them in a business suit, walk them down the street to Grand Rapids, and no one would take a second look. But behaviorally, consciously, spiritually, morally, um, that archaic human being, that old homo sapien would be a far cry from the type of human being that you would get uh, 150,000 years later. So I think it's, it's only when humanity sort of comes of age, spiritually, morally, uh, consciously, um, that they're ready to know God's will and to receive uh, uh, perhaps a special revelation from God and the ability to keep it to transcend their their natural default setting of of selfishness and um, to do like Steve said to care for the widow and the orphan you know to do things that are, that go beyond just promoting group survival Steve and I have talked about this I I don't agree that evolution uh, can account for human morality fully because the kinds of things that God in Christ calls us to go far beyond the sort of types of altruism that would be, uh, that would promote survival. But it would be somewhere in, in that time period of 40,000 years ago. Dan, Dan thank you for, for, for your talk to us tonight. You have 12 points there. On 11 of them, I'm very comfortable. Uh, and well, that's good. <laughs> and that's more than I agree with myself uh, most of the time. The, the one point that, that I would uh, like to take uh, a note of is point seven, uh, the key points on the science of uh, human origins. I think you're giving a little bit more consensus to, to the picture that uh, paleoanthropologists are giving than they are giving themselves. Huh. Um, okay. Let's it, it's true that uh, Johansson's book is... Uh, Oh, it's uh, well, half a dozen years old now. Um, he um, 
Uh, a lot of things have been found since that time. But the general scenario of that uh, book is still in existence. Right. Well, right. Like you say, hey, 40,000 years ago, th things took a twist here that, that we don't. I, I just want to say, hey, I, I just don't want to all line up and uh, say, hey, there's a consensus out there. Because, hey, we, we, we don't have a consensus. What's, what's the lack of consensus on? What point is it? Oh, is the, the, the 10,000 years bottleneck. Mm. I mean, the 10,000 people bottleneck 200,000 years ago, that they were homo sapiens as we understand imagery. As I've read the literature, that is the consensus. I've, yeah, I've I, consulted I, yeah. a lot of uh, literature. And, uh, you know, I, the out of Africa hypothesis was disputed. Yeah. But in the last 10 or 20 years, that, that hypothesis has kind of yeah, I kind just, of, uh, trumped I just the don't others. see that consensus mm. in my reading. Well, you're maybe better, better read than I am yeah. then. I admit to being an amateur when it comes to the, uh, okay. to the science. Okay. But, but I do appreciate your comments. Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Lou. Uh, there undoubtedly will have been a measure of literalism and in our view of inspiration some mechanical inspiration. Do you see that that may have been a hindrance to the faith of some of the younger generations among us so that the genius of our reformed interpretation of Genesis may have been an obstacle to the faith? Well, I don't think the history of reformed theology has been an obstacle to anything. Um, and I don't, want, I, I don't want to be guilty of what C.S. Lewis called chronological chauvinism. I I don't want to say that, well, we now have so much more information. We are so much smarter than, you know, uh, Augustine and the Reformers. We have learned some things about the creation um, that, that just were not known in their day. And um, as a biblical scholar, I would say we now have these other texts, these older ancient Near Eastern texts that resemble Genesis in many ways, but... Uh, but which Genesis really theologically argues against. And as I said in my talk, they, they've given biblical scholars a better, I think, awareness of the type of literature the early chapters of Genesis are and what is really driving them theologically, what the really the truth claims inherent in the biblical narrative are. You know, Augustine and the Reformers and the, fr the framers of our confessions didn't, uh, didn't have those. And without those, I would think any person would would read the, the narratives straight off the page and take them as, as historical, these early chapters. And I think Christians today who continue to do that, I mean, that it's a perfectly rational thing for them to do that. I mean, they have the weight of, you know, almost 2,000 years of church history on their side. I just wanted to point out that there is this alternate way of, of reading it, that many, many Christians, uh, not just those in mainline denominations or in the Catholic Church, but even in evangelicalism, are, are open to, open to read Genesis with, uh, with a kind of new understanding. Um, I believe that the Bible turned out exactly the way uh, God intended it to, and I believe the author of Genesis was divinely inspired to, uh, to write the kind of narratives uh, that he did. And um, the Bible needs no apologies. The, the, the biblical writer didn't make any mistakes. If there are any mistakes, it's we who are fallible in our interpretation. Uh, we are prone to make mistakes in, in what we take away from Scripture. And so that's why we need uh, theologians and biblical scholars, and we need each other. We need to interpret scripture in the community of faith because the Bible is the church's book. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dan, for your uh, presentation, which I think is extremely uh, helpful. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to give a little anecdote, personal experience, and then make a, a comment and get your comment in response. As you know, I retired from Religion and Theology Department in 1999 and went immediately to China. And I think I was the first uh, Western theologian to teach a course in Christianity uh, on a semester basis in the new China. Uh, 
I started with Genesis, and I asked my students to read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and I would ask them the next week uh, for their reaction. And the next week I waited, and of course, typically there was silence, until one very bright student, turned out to be the brightest in the class, uh, said uh, <clears throat> very hesitantly, very respectfully, uh, Dr. Holtrup, uh, uh, do Western Christians actually believe that Adam and Eve were real people? I never got that question at Calvin. <laughs> but my response was, yes, they do. And probably the majority. And he hesitated and he said, I find that incredible. He said, we, we Eastern people are brought up on these stories. And we never stopped to ask if the characters were real. We asked what the story means. That event in 2001 kicked me off for the past 10, 12 years of seeing differences between Eastern and Western worldviews. And right. That's I think interesting. Uh, to underscore your point, it's not only necessary that uh, worldview and cultural assumptions uh, must be translated, we have to critique our own assumptions and realize their constrictions. For example, uh, this kicked me off on a study of uh, contrasts. You have strong individualism, attention to detail in stories in the West. You don't in China. Uh, you, you have holism. You begin with the assumption that the story means something as a whole. Hmm. This is very important in reading Genesis. Uh, you have a horizontal, egalitarian approach in the West. You have a vertical, uh, hierarchical approach in the East. And it just strikes me that the biblical materials are much more Eastern than what we Westerners recognize. And this is a terribly important point. So it's not only to recognize or to uh, see that the Bible is, is an Eastern genre. We have to see the limitations. Part of our problem is who we are. Right. I think it's especially, though, what Paul says about Adam in Romans 5. That comparison contrast with Christ uh, has been so important in Western Christianity. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I offered a different view of that, that this uh, was part of Paul's assumption, uh, you know, that all humanity was descended from, from one right. man and one woman. Uh, I think that's the real kicker. But you're absolutely right about a different worldview between East and well, West. Well, a lot of it, I think, we want to be so logical. And the scripture's intent is not to be logical or to be accurate by our standards. Any other questions? Alex has one up here, and there's one on the back row. Okay. If you maintain that uh, the transmission of sin is genetic, then genetic engineering might do something about it. <laughs> it seems to me that's a difficult thing to maintain. Yeah. You know, I, as a non-scientist, I really don't know how sin is heritable, you know, at, at the genetic level. I, I, we would need a geneticist to talk about this. Jeff Schloss, I think, broached the subject over lunch with uh, Jack Rhoda, Kelly Clark, and I a few weeks ago. Um, but it, it kind of went over my head. Um, how, how behavior, a certain kind of inclination... Uh, it can instantiate itself biologically in one's progeny. Um, that's something I would like to learn about. I haven't done enough reading or studying about it. It's uh, seven, almost 7.30, and uh, you've been up front long enough. Okay. And so what we're, we'd like to do is uh, invite you for coffee and to continue the conversation. Uh, Dan will be at one of those tables, and you can ask him whatever questions you have.
Uh, again, let's give them a round of applause.